Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, global quantitative proteomics. And so as Steve said, uh, this talk is going to be more applications focused than what you may have heard yesterday. But my goal is to try and tie together a lot of the things you heard yesterday so you can see how they all come together in a quantitative proteomics workflow. And so by now, especially if you were here yesterday, you know that proteomics is essentially studying the protein complement of a cell. And when we talk about studying proteins in a discovery-based mode, we mean studying that protein complement of a cell in an unbiased manner. And the goals of modern-day proteomics experiments are not to just generate catalogs of proteins in particular samples, but to actually look at varieties of samples that can be similar but experimentally perturbed and to understand how proteins across those sample types are regulated or changed. But as you heard a lot about yesterday, the issue is that mass spectrometry is not inherently quantitative. And the reasons that Jake and others talked about include that peptides that are generated from proteins have different physiochemical properties and in turn have different responses in the mass spectrometer. Another issue that Jake brought up was matrix effects. Um, another thing to think about is that in a label-free mode where you individually look at samples and try and do quantitation is the fact that mass spectrometers only sample a percentage of the total peptides. And so it can be difficult then with missing points to look at how proteins change across multiple samples. And so because of th these points, we have to think about how to design our experiment in a way to complete robust relative quantification. And I'd like to stress that the quantification that I'm going to be talking about today is distinct from what Hasmik Kashishian spoke about yesterday, where known targets are trying to be quantified in different samples using heavy labeled peptides and standards. Here, we're doing this in an unbiased way. OK, so before we get into any details, though, what are the general goals of a quantitative proteomics experiment? And so there are, of course, going to be different specific goals depending on what samples you're looking at and what you're trying to do. But the overarching goal is usually to look at how proteins change across a variety of sample types. And this can be samples that have been treated with drugs, or they can be treated with different perturbagens at various time points or concentration points. They can be samples where proteins or other molecules have been overexpressed or genes have been knocked out. Um, Another popular application of quantitative proteomics is also to look at interactors of particular baits, look at protein interactors of particular baits. And I'm going to talk about some specific applications towards the end of the talk. But this is just to say that we can look at a variety of baits, proteins, RNA, DNA, small molecules. And we can use quantitative proteomics to look at what is specifically binding to these molecules. And lastly, I'd just like to say that, as you heard about yesterday, we can work in a variety of sample types. So they can be cell lines, they can be tissues, they can be biological fluids such as urine or plasma. OK, so before we get into any details, I just wanted to show you a workflow for a modern day mass spectrometry experiment, or what's called a shotgun proteomics experiment. So as you heard about yesterday, you isolate proteins from a particular source. And you bring these proteins to peptides using proteases. In our case, we're typically using trypsin, but we're not limited to trypsin. And trypsin cleaves C-terminal to arginines and lysines. These peptides are then introduced into um, a mass spectrometer. And, this, and the mass spectrometer is coupled online to a high performance ultra pressure liquid chromatography system. And so here, I actually have shown you pictures of what we have in the lab currently. Um, this mass spectrometer is called a Q-exactive mass spectrometer, and it's really state of the art and um, in terms of what's on the market today. And as Steve talked to you yesterday, one of the nice things about the Q-exactive mass spectrometer is that you have the ability to acquire data in the MS and MSMS -MS mode. Um, and it's high resolution. So 
as your data is acquiring in the mass spectrometer, um, you generate something called a base peak chromatogram. And this chromatogram is similar to a chromatogram you can think about in, in HPLC separation. So you have time on the x-axis and you have counts on the y-axis. And so as peptides are eluding, you develop this chromatogram. And at very closely spaced points in time, you take an MS spectrum. And what that is is a survey of what species or what ions are coming out at a particular time. And in a data-dependent experiment, what we typically use for discovery-based proteomics, we tell the mass spectrometer to look at this MS spectrum and, tell a, and determine what, for example, are the 12 most abundant signals in that spectrum and take an MS-MS spectrum of those 12 abundant signals. And then after an MS-MS spectrum has been taken consecutively on those 12 signals, to put those signals on a list so they don't get sampled again, so that we have the ability to not just continue sampling abundant species, but to dig deeper and increase our dynamic range. So after your acquisition is complete, raw data is generated. And that raw data, as Carl talked to you about yesterday, can be um, uh, put into a database search. And there are a variety of algorithms that can be used. And this database search looks at your MS and your MS-MS uh, data and comes up with a list of peptides. And these peptides can be rolled up into proteins. But again, in a modern experiment, you don't want to just generate lists of peptides and proteins. And most likely, you want to have a quantitative aspect to this workflow so that you can really start to look at protein regulation. And so what we need to do is add an isotopic labeling component to this workflow to enable robust relative quantification. And so Jake touched, Jake talked about this in some detail yesterday. And so I'm just going to go over this briefly. but. When, when embarking on a quantitative proteomics experiment, the first step is to choose a quanti quantitation method. And that's actually something we and our collaborators, together with our collaborators, spent a lot of time thinking about. And the um, decision can, is based on what type of sample and what the goals of your experiment are. So on this side of the slide, you see these box diagrams. And what they're showing are the different steps in the proteomic workflow and at what points samples are either combined or left separately. And so here you have metabolic labeling, which in our case we're talking about SILAC, which Jake and others talked about yesterday. You have chemical labeling, so ITRAC or TMT, and then you have this label-free approach. So of course in SILAC, one of the biggest advantages is that you have high precision. And that comes from the fact that you can combine your samples um, up front. And so you can combine at the protein level. And again, in SILAC, as Jake told you yesterday, cells are grown in media that contain either light or heavy isotopically labeled amino acids. So your proteins either have light or heavy labeled arginines. Um, some of the other advantages of SILAC are the fact that, of course, because you're combining so upfront in your workflow, your sample handling biases are minimal. And a finer point is that MSMS of all states is not required to necessarily identify or quantify your SILAC du duplicates or triplicates. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then, of course, you have the multiplexing capability. So you don't have to analyze both of these samples individually. They're combined, and they're analyzed as a single sample. Some of the drawbacks, SILAC media can be expensive, um, but the output is far greater than anything you're going to do label-free. So, so we really uh, push for all of our quantitative experiments to be done in either a SILAC or a chemical labeling mode. Then here you have the chemical labeling workflow. And here there, there are vari other varieties, TMT, MTRAC, but here and as Jake told you yesterday, we're typically doing something called eye track. So here, um, the labeling is done at the peptide level. And so samples are kept separately through the protein isolation step and through the digestion step. And they're labeled and then combined only at the peptide level, which 
the advantages are you still have high precision, but of course, you don't account for variability that happens upstream of your digest. You still have your multiplexing capability. And one really big advantage of eye track is that it's suitable for most sample types. So one disadvantage of SILAC can be that your sample may not be amenable to SILAC labeling. So if you're trying to work in tissue or some primary cell line, SILAC labeling, of course, can be very difficult or impossible. Um, one of the drawbacks of eye track, when you start to get above several hundred micrograms of sample, so if you're looking at PTMs, it can get quite expensive. So these are the things we think about when we start a quantitative proteomics experiment with you. And then lastly, you have the label-free approach, which Jake talked about. And this is not something that we typically prefer. Of course, the advantage is that it's cheap and easy because you don't have to do any isotopic labeling, but you have low precision. You have variability due to sample handling. It's not suitable for multi-stage protocols, which Monica talked about yesterday, um, and a variety of other reasons. So typically, when you come to us and want to start a collaboration in quantitative proteomics, we're going to talk about using one of these two workflows. OK, so this is that same workflow I just showed you, but now with the addition of the quantitative component. So here, this is an example specifically uh, for a sil of SILAC proteomics experiment. So you have three cellular states labeled in light, medium, or heavy. Again, you generate peptides. You do your LC-MS-MS with the um, QXACTA mass spectrometer. Now your MS spectra have three signals for every peptide or every ion. So these are your three SILAC states. You do your fragmentation, as I previously described. And then you choose an algorithm that can both quantify and identify peptides from these samples. And your output now is not just a catalog of peptides and proteins, but identified peptides and proteins with corresponding ratios. And then you can take this data and do statistical analyses to determine what in my system is changing, what is regulated. OK. So um, I just wanted to briefly touch on when we say we search the data, what do we actually need to search MS data? And, and Carl did an excellent job giving you a lot of details on searching and peptide identification yesterday. So this is going to be a little bit more general. But um, after we acquire our um, data, we, have our, we get our raw files. And so typically for thermal mass spectrometers, these are in the .raw format. Of course, um, and, and these, these formats are typically very specific to the instrument type. So when you choose an algorithm to search your data, you have to make sure that the algorithm can um, work with your, your um, raw data type of interest. Um, just for your interest, the file sizes that we typically generate now are range from 500 megabytes all the way up to 2 gigabytes. And these file sizes over the years have actually dramatically increased. And this is because of that mass spectrometers have the capability now to acquire data in the high resolution mode, both at the MS level and at the MSMS level. There are a large number of search engines that can be used for analyzing proteomics data. In our lab, we typically use one of two search engines. Um, Carl did talk about these yesterday, MaxQuant and SpectraMill. I'll give you a little bit more details in a few slides. You have to pick a database. Typically, our databases are in the FASTA format. For We've moved as a lab now to the Unipro database. So you, you can find these databases at the Unipro website. Um, we also typically put a database together that contains common laboratory contaminants because just because you're working in, for example, a human cell system doesn't mean they're not going to be abundant proteins that may come from your skin or your hair. And so you want to be able to search for those things in your sample. As Carl described yesterday, we typically use some sort of decoy database. And then, of course, any additional protein sequences. So if you're doing an IP and you have a particular protein construct that may not be in the human database because it has a flag tag or an HA tag, you want to include that. And then finally, you need a local computer or a server. And so for global um, proteomics experiments, we're typically generating about 24 files per proteome. And so these 24 files take about one to two days using eight processors. OK, so these are just um, some details on the typical search engines we use for quantitative proteomics. So at the top, 
Um, I've um, listed some features of Spectrum Mill, which Carl gave us a lot of details on yesterday. So uh, Spectrum Mill is commercially available through Agilent Technologies. And the biggest one of the biggest bonuses for us is that it's developed by Carl in our lab. And so you can imagine that things are not always straightforward, and we can always go to Carl and get um, lots of help with Spectrum Mill. Um, and Spectrum Mill is a comprehensive suite of software tools, so it's not just for extracting MS data and searching it, but there are many things you can do with Spectrum Mill. Um, one of them is this excellent spectrum, spectral viewer that Spectrum Mill has. So a lot of times we or our collaborators will actually want to view the raw data, and Spectrum Mill is, very, is a very good program at being able to do that. Um, and so it has intelligent spectral extraction. You have multiple search options. Something that Spectrum Mill does very nicely is iterative searching that not a lot of programs have the capability to do. And so if you search your data, you can say, well, these hits are valid. I would like to now search for other modifications or other sequences. So you can do this with Spectrum Mill, so that's very nice. Um, and then another program that we use quite often is MaxQuant. And MaxQuant is freely available um, from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and its developer is Jürgen Cox um, from Matthias Mann's lab. And so, again, a big bonus for MaxQuant is that it is freely available, and it's a very good program. So it's a quantitative proteomic software package, and it's been designed for analyzing large mass spectrometry data sets, and it's been specifically aimed at high-resolution MS data. And so it does its spectral extraction and feature detection very well. It's highly automated, and one of the nice things about MaxQuant is that it generates result summaries that require minimal post-processing on our end, and can be and the, all the data tables that it generates, and I'll show you some examples of this later in the talk, they can be easily cross-referenced. One of the disadvantages of MaxQuant is that it's currently not compatible with iTrack data. So this is just a screenshot of the front page of Spectrum Mill. And so if you've ever get the chance to use it, you will you'll come to this page and you, you can see that we have lots of options um, in Spectrum Mill. And so I tried to highlight some of the main modules that we typically use in Spectrum Mill. So Spectrum Mill has a data extractor component where peaks are detected. Um, and then you have your MSMS search module. So here's where you will define parameters that you would like to search your data with. So modifications, are they SILAC labeled? What are the constraints on your data? And then you have a peptide and protein summary table module. So in this module, the program, based on a user preference, can generate different types of tables. So protein-centric tables, peptide-centric tables. And then you have this tool belt module, which is really nice because it gives you data characteristics. So if you want to know, for example, how many MSMS spectra were validated in my, in my particular data set, or how many peptides were of a particular charge state. Spectrum Mill can generate these sorts of things here. And then lastly, this is a, something called MS Product, which is a really excellent module that I even use when I, before coming to um, the Broad, where you can generate MS fragment maps for interpretation of MSMS MS spectra. And so this is really nice when you want to go into the raw data and see, does my peptide sequence and does this MSMS MS spectrum, do they correlate? So you can generate the predicted um, product ion masses for a particular peptide here. OK? So this is, um, for MaxQuant, the general workflow here. So you start with an instrument that has the capability to generate at least high-resolution MS1 data. You have your raw data. Again, MaxQuant does feature detection or identifies um, uh, MS1 signals. It goes through searching using a program called Andromeda. And then ultimately does quantification and identification of your peptides. It generates a number of output tables, and I'll show you a schematic of this in a few slides. Um, MaxQuant also has another module that's called Perseus, where it gives you the ability to do statistical analyses on your data, which is quite nice. Um, and MaxQuant also has 
a viewer for inspection of raw data, but I can tell you that it doesn't always work so well and it, it's not as nice as the viewer that you get with Spectrum Mill. So you can see here that there's advantages and disadvantages to both. So, so depending again on what type of, um, what the project is, what, what the goal of the project is, we work between these two software packages. Okay, so this, this um, point, Jake did talk about yesterday, but I'd just like to make it again because it's important. How do we actually quantify peptides? And this is an example of how, we quant how a program like MaxQuant will quantify um, SILAC pairs. So you've seen this now. So in a sample where you're working with three SILAC states, you have these three clusters representing your light, medium, and heavy peptides. And basically, what a program like MaxQuant will do is to look at the signal in M over Z and count space, but also it does what's called 3D peak detection, and it looks in the time domain as well. And it compares these signals for all SILAC states to then come up with peptide ratios and ultimately protein ratios. Okay, so this is an example of the type of output you get from uh, database searching. This is specific to MaxQuant, but um, Spectrum Mill generates similar types of tables. So, you, so all of the things that are boxed here are different types of tables that you get out of MaxQuant. So you get a protein-centric table. You can get a peptide-centric table. You can get an MSMS -MS scan-centric table. And you can get a modification site-centric table. And you can imagine that these different types of tables will be important to you and very useful to you depending on what type of analysis you're doing. So if you're doing protein level work, you probably want to be looking at a protein centric table and a peptide centric table. But if you're doing modification level work, looking at phosphorylation sites, you might be focused on a modification centric site table. And one other advantage of um, these tables that are generated here in MaxQuant is that they can all be easily cross-referenced to each other. And that actually helps both us and you. So these are the types of tables that we, with some level of processing, will send to you. And this is the output of, of these quantitative experiments. OK, so what, does one of, what do one of these um, data tables look like? So this is an example of a protein-centric table. These tables actually can be very long lengthwise and widthwise. So I've just cut down to some of the important columns here. And so, um, so it's a protein-centric table. So each row is a protein. You have the protein name. You have the gene name. What you might also want to know is how many unique peptides were identified that gives evidence for that particular protein. You may want to know what's my sequence coverage of that protein, which you get here. What's the molecular weight? What's my SILAC or eye track ratio? How many, um, how many quantifications went into generating that ratio? And then ultimately, based on the entire da data set, what is the p-value for that ratio? So is that particular protein regulated in my data set? I'd just like to point out, too, that the ratios that we typically um, are, are typically in this table are actually normalized ratios. And the reason that we need to normalize ratios is because you may not have an exact one-to-one -one ratio due to mixing, due to incomplete labeling. And so these ratios are typically median normalized. And this is just showing you what, for example, an unnormalized set of ratios looks like for about 8,000 proteins versus a normalized set. And of course, normalization just makes comparison across larger data sets much easier. Okay, and as Jake told you yesterday, protein identities and their quantifications come from peptide level data. So, for example, you see here that there were seven unique peptides that were used to identify this particular protein, which are listed here. Their ratios, each peptide gets a ratio. The median of these ratios are found. And that median is then the protein ratio. 
and you see. So typically, we like to um, take into consideration proteins that have at least two unique peptides. And of course, the, the more peptides you have, the more evidence for that protein you have. But you also need to take into account the number of ratios that were calculated for that protein. So it's a matter of how robust is your quantification and how robust is your identification. And so you saw this slide from Jake yesterday, but I thought it was important to include here again. It's not necessarily straightforward identifying peptides to proteins because, as you can imagine, there are many peptides out there that are identical between protein sequences. So in this example, you have this peptide that matches to protein X as well as protein Y. But we typically go with this preponderance that the most evidence you have for a particular protein, where here it's protein X because you have more peptides identified for protein X than you do Y. Using this Occam's razor principle, we would assign this peptide to protein X, and it's called a razor peptide. And as Jake also touched on yesterday, of course, we have people that are interested in looking at particular isoforms. And these isoforms may have many peptides that are shared between them. And so if you want to quantify particular isoforms, look at the difference, the effects on one isoform for the other, what you need to do is to look at peptides that are distinct to those proteins. And it's more tricky, but it can be done. But because now you have lower numbers of peptides used for quantification, your statistics, your statistics may get worse. OK. So just these next two slides I thought were pretty important to bring up because these are questions we often get from our collaborators. So the first is, do we need replicate measurements? And the answer usually is yes. Um, but what type of replicates, biological or te technical? And so biological replicates, we say, are almost always necessary. But technical replicates aren't necessarily always necessary. So this is a nice figure I took from a, t from a paper from Matthias Mann's lab from 2011 in MCP, where they were doing a SILAC experiment. And this is the plot of ratios. Um, from two technical replicates versus biological replicates. And you can see, basically, that the spread from a technical replicate is not very much at all. And so um, what we typically say is two to three biological replicates are sufficient for discovery-based quantitative proteomics experiment, but we don't necessarily focus on doing technical replicates. Replicates, of course, increase confidence in calling a protein significantly regulated. And replicates gain much more importance uh, for PTM analysis, which Philip will talk to you about next. OK. And so when we're completing replicates, another point to think about is doing swapping of isotopic labels. And why is this important? So here, um, so the point here is that label swaps enable differentiation of contaminants from cell culture and from the laboratory. So here you see you have two experiments, and these are replicates. And in the first replicate, you have cell line A that was grown in the light condition and cell line B that was grown in heavy media. But in the second experiment, now your cell lines have been swapped. So now B isn't grown in light and A is grown in heavy. And the advantage of doing something like this is shown in the scatter plot. So this is the SILAC ratio from experiment one versus replicate two. Uh, from experiment two plotted against each other. So you can see here are the unchanged proteins. You have your upregulated proteins in this upper quadrant and your downregulated proteins down here. But these proteins, after doing a label flip that are anticorrelating, end up here. And so typically you have serum contaminants, contaminants from your hair, from your skin, that will only exist in the light state. And so they don't properly, they don't flip in a SILAC experiment. So this is very important to um, filter out things like this from your experiment. OK. So this is another workflow. And it's a little bit more detailed. So this is really what our current large-scale quantitative proteomics workflow looks like for doing large-scale proteome level analyses. So you start with either ITRAC or SILAC. Here again is, is this 
is a SILAC experiment. Um, you mix your, you isolate your proteins, you mix them, you generate peptides. And as Monica touched on yesterday, in order to increase our depth of coverage, we, we have to do some level of fractionation, sometimes extensive. And so here, uh, we're typically generating about 24 fractions using basic reversed phase pH chromatography. And so this is done offline. And then each of these fractions is individually injected into the mass spectrometer. We do data analysis with either MaxQuan or SpectraMill, and then we follow that up with statistical analyses to determine change or regulation in our system. And this pipeline, on average, takes about two to three weeks to complete. OK, so what's a typical output from a large-scale quantitative proteomics study? So the input. Um, we're typically working with somewhere in the range of 100 micrograms per channel, whether it be eye track or SILAC. We're generating about 24 fractions. The average runtime per fraction is, on the mass spectrometer is about two and a half hours. The average number of quantified proteins per replicate is somewhere in the range of seven to 8,000, which is really state of the art. That's, a, um, that's, that's really um, a huge increase from what What's been, out, what's been out there recently. And that's, that's really attributed to upfront fractionation and also the increase in speed and sensitivity of our mass spectrometers. And the average number of quantified peptides per replicate is somewhere on the order of 100,000. So I just wanted to put, oops, I just wanted to put these numbers and this figure down here to give you an idea of what all this means. So, the number of predicted proteins in the proteome is somewhere around 20 to 25,000. And the number of predicted triptych peptides is around a million. And so you can see that although these numbers represent state-of-the-art experiments, we're, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And as Steve told you yesterday, we see improvements in mass spectrometers every uh, several years. and so you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be improving these numbers in the future. Also, if you're used to doing genome profiling experiments, you're used to closer to 100% sequence coverage. This is to show you the type of sequence coverages we get for proteins. So this is a histogram of the percent sequence coverage um, from a list of about 8,000 proteins. So you can see on average we have about 40% sequence coverage of our proteins, which is quite good. But again, there's room for improvement. OK. And then um, from all of this data, what do we typically do? We typically use T-statistics or Gaussian modeling to determine what proteins are up or down regulated. Typically, we have tens um, of proteins that are perturbed in global proteome samples. You can take data a step further, and you can do enrichment and clustering. Or you can look at um, protein interactions using software that allows you to generate interaction maps. And Mani and Casper are going to talk um, in a little bit more detail about uh, doing some of this later on in this section. OK, so I just wanted to show you one example of a global quantitative proteomics workflow that has been led in our lab by Philip, who's going to talk next. So in this study, um, we wanted to look at the effects of Velcade, which is a proteasome inhibitor. Um, on global protein levels. And so in this experiment, cells were grown, uh, jerkit cells were grown uh, in SILAC media, either light or heavy. And the heavy state here was treated with Velcade for four hours at one micromolar concentration. And for this experiment, three biological replicates were completed. And what you can see is that the overlap of proteins identified and quantified from three biological replicates is slightly over 7,000, which is really great. If you plot the data from replicate one versus replicate two, you see very nice reproducibility. Points that are colored in black are deemed to be uh, not regulated. And points that are colored in red are deemed to be reproducible, reproducibly regulated using t-statistics. And so the overall results from this study were that we have very high proteome coverage. We find that approximately 1% of proteins are regulated by Velcade. And what was also found um, using gene ontology enrichment, which Mani will talk 
Mani and Casper will talk about more in detail, was that a large percentage of these upregulated proteins were cell cycle regulators. So for example, MAP kinase, CMIC, cyclin D. And so this is also shown here in this protein interaction map. And so the, the circles that are colored in purple are proteins that were found to be upregulated in the study. OK, so I also told you on the first slide that one popular application of quantitative proteomics is to look at bait interactions or protein-protein interactions. And so this is just a cartoon outlining what that workflow would look like. And so here you have two SILAC states. Again, you have a control state and a state where you'd like to look at interactors of a specific protein. So you may, in this state, have an exogenously expressed protein, such as a flag tag protein. And here, your control, your negative control might be an empty vector. You IP your proteins separately, and then you will loop what protein, you loop proteins after the IP, and you mix them one to one, and you digest together. And then what you look for, you, you have two sets of data. You have data where things are not changing, so things that are equally bound to the control and the specific bait, so this could be binders to the beads or the antibody. And then you have things that are specifically being bound to your bait, and these will be your putative interactors. And so this is just a real life example of a, um, a protein interaction experiment. So this work was done with Philip in collaboration with Mark Lee and Nirha Cohen's lab. And the goal of this experiment was to identify candidate regulators of the interferon stimulatory DNA response through analysis of protein-protein interactors of um, key proteins. And so in this setting, they were interested in a protein called Sting, which had an HA tag. And they were looking at interactors of Sting in the presence or absence of viral DNA. And what you can see here on the left is that in this upper right quadrant, you have sting, which is your bait that is highly enriched in your um, medium or your heavy sample, which is exactly what the case should be. And all of these points here are the punitive interactors of this protein. And so using this workflow, as Monica has showed you yesterday, where you IP your proteins, you combine, you go into a gel, you do a digest, it takes about one day of instrument time um, they got about 1,400 proteins quantified and about 25 specific interactors. And the last application I'd like to show you of quantitative proteomics is the workflow for identifying targets of small molecules in a cellular context in SILAC and affinity proteomics. And this work is currently led by Monica Scanone in our group. Um, and so this is just a cartoon showing you how this workflow um, is put together. So you have two SILAC states here. And the point of an experiment like this may be you have a small molecule and you want to know what binds to my small molecule of, um, that I have. So you can immobilize your small molecule onto a bead. You can then incubate beads that have your small molecule in either two of your experimental conditions. And then you can compete off one state with free small molecule to see what proteins are coming off. And again, once you combine samples and you analyze, you can get a comprehensive rank ordered list of binding proteins to your small molecule. And so a real life example of this was something that Monica and Xiao and Ong worked on in our lab, was to identify targets of a promiscuous kinase inhibitor, K K252A. And so here you see K252A that's been tethered to an agarose bead. And using the workflow I just described, they were able to identify 20 known kinases that are specific targets of this kinase inhibitor. And you can see here in the scatter plot from two biological replicates that your putative interactors are up in this upper right quadrant. And so this is a really nice way to look at targets of small molecules using quantitative proteomics. And that's all I have for today. This is just a list of key references that you might find useful um, that touch on some of the topics I talked about. Um, and so I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. For the last slide, so you uh, went through the last 10 minutes. Yep.
So that's a big limitation. So so tethering. Oh, so. Right, so the question was, what are the limitations of a workflow like this where you want to look at interactors of a particular small molecule? So one, and Monica can probably speak to this in more detail, but one of the major limitations is being able to tether your molecule, immobilize your molecule to a bead and have it still be functional. Um, Yeah, so I think I mentioned, so for to do a global quantitative proteomics experiment where you want to look unbiasedly at the proteome of your sample, you're probably looking at, I would say, two and a half to three weeks, including processing and data analysis. <coughs> 